Well, if you guys don't know who I am, my name is Clint. I am the youth pastor here. My wife, Kayla, is right over there. And uh, my kids are in the service and this service too. So if you hear any crazy commotion, it's probably my five-year-old, all right? So, um, and then uh, that's it. That's all I was gonna say. I just was thrown off by the Eagles jersey that I saw in the balcony a little while ago. And I was like, go Cowboys. That's all I was thinking, so. But this is the only chance that we have for glory is three minutes on the stage because we can't win a game, you know what I'm saying? Hey, either way. I know, I know. Listen, I take it. I could take it, all right? But listen, don't text me after we lose. It's not good. Don't text Pastor Mike when the Dolphins lose either. It's not good. That's why we don't like some of you guys. No, I'm just messing with you. Hey, it's an honor to be able to be the youth pastor here at LifePoint and hang out and like just get to be on such an incredible staff. We have an incredible church, an incredible staff, incredible people. You guys are incredible. It's an honor to be able to partner with parents and helping you raise God-fearing and God-honoring uh, adults. We get to, you know, your kids become adults. So that's what we're doing here. We're turning your students into God-honoring adults. And Gavin pointed it out. Didn't Gavin do a good job on transition, right? And um, Pastor Tammy's been the one that's been pushing for, for Gavin to do transition. So when he said, give it up for the guests, I was cheering for Gavin. I was like, woo, Gavin. All right, so he did a good job. And Gavin's homegrown. Like, he's grown up here his whole life, so that's so good. But um, we had teenagers do announcements. We had teenagers do on the worship team. Uh, Charlotte and Javion, they were up here jumping around, trying to get the room to jump. And some of you guys were going hard. I saw some of you guys jumping, and we had musicians. And then sometimes, a lot of the time, actually, we don't have it today because a lot of them has to be off, but... A lot of the tech stuff that you guys see, words on the screen, the computers, if you guys are watching at home, a lot of that stuff is done by teenagers, okay? And then, actually, I've had the honor to work in the kids' ministry for the last several months, and over 40% of our kids' dream team, it's over 68 people, we have 68 people on the kids' dream team, just so you guys know, that's, how, that's a big team, okay? And over 40% of that group is teenagers. So thank you to all the teenagers that serve, that continue to serve. You guys are amazing. And um, that means you trust your kids with teenagers too. Amen. Hello, somebody. Come on. Um, and then I want to also take a moment to, to thank all the youth leaders. We have roughly 31 youth leaders, and you're thinking, like, roughly? It's because they have life happen, and sometimes they quit. They come in, and they're like, these kids are insane. I'm getting out of here, all right? And then other people are like, I want to be a part of these insane kids' lives. And so that number is always changing. But if you're a youth leader, would you mind standing up so we can just celebrate you this morning for a moment? Come on. All the youth leaders, you're amazing. That's right, Aiden. I see you, Aiden. I don't see you, Angel. I'm not taking it personal or anything. No, okay. All right, so um, let's go. We wanted to give you guys a small taste of what youth ministry feels like on a Wednesday. And who knows that you can have fun at church? Like, there's this misconception that church can't be fun. Would you look at your neighbor and say, it's okay to have fun? And now you look back at them and go, it's because you're funny looking, right? <laughs> yes, it's okay to have fun. Jesus had fun, friends, Okay. Jesus didn't walk around serious all the time like your great Aunt Marge, okay? Like Jesus had fun. Somebody say Jesus had fun. Jesus had fun. So I thought we'd play a game this morning, and no better person to play this game than Pastor Mike. All right, give it up for Pastor Mike. Come on, Pastor Mike. Yeah. So here's the deal. We can't have Pastor Mike play the game by himself. We, we need to have a guys versus girls competition. And so I pre-selected somebody, Alicia Conley, come up here, play this game. And, and when I was picking out a game, I was like, I got to pick out a game that, that old people know how to play. So I thought Alicia would be perfect, all right? So, all right? So <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So we're going to play a game called 80s Flashback. 80s Flashback. Who was alive in the 80s? All the 80s babies. Come on. Yes. Who was alive before the 80s? Yeah, praise God. Praise God. Terrible. Yeah, I know. I heard somebody else said it, not me. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask a question. It's going to be, there's going to be three options on the stage, or three options on the screen. I'm going to put my hand out. I'm going to read the whole question. Then I'm going to put my hand out, and whoever slaps my hand first gets to answer the question. We're going to do guys versus girls. Guys, who thinks Pastor Mike's going to take it? Yeah. And ladies, who thinks Pastor Mike's going to take it? Alicia is going to take it. I don't know if y'all think she's going to take it or you're just excited that it's the first time you've seen a Cabbage Patch doll in that many years, all right? Let's take a look at the first question this morning. 
The first question is, compact disc dominated what in the 80s? What was the maximum amount of tracks that could be put on one disc? 1999 or 119? All right. 19. 19 is 19 the answer? Oh, zeros, zeros. Next question. Name the Avengers actor who got his acting start in the 19, in, in 1980s comedies. Is it Chris Evans, Jeremy Renner, or Robert Downey Jr.? Oh, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike. Robert Downey Jr. He says Robert Downey Jr. Is it Robert Downey? It is. There's a little fun fact there. He was often a goofy side character, a villain. All right, next one. Name the arcade game that launched Mario into the public eye. Is it Donkey Kong, Super Mario Brothers, or, or Burger Time? <laughs> Wait, let's go again. Ready? One, two, three, go. All right. <laughs> What's the answer? Super Mario Brothers. What's the answer? It's, it wasn't a trick question. Donkey Kong. She said, is it a trick question? It wasn't a trick question. It was a, that was the real answer. All right. So what's the score Pastor Mike has? Miss Alicia has? Ah, ladies, you were so excited. You sound like the Cowboys at the beginning of the year. All right. Yeah, all right. What was Michael Jordan's basketball jersey number during all of his wins in the 1980s? 1980s. <laughs> Pastor Mike got it. Is it 23? 23. We'll do the last one just for fun since there's no way you can come back and win, all right? So she did win in first service with different questions, just for the record, all right? So according to a 19, to hit 1981 song, who will you reach if you dial 8675309? Jenny. Is it Jenny? It's Jenny. Can you guys give it up for Pastor Mike and Miss Alicia this morning? Here, put, the, put that up. Awesome. You guys get to know what their prize is? It's nothing. This is the youth department. All right. So, man, you guys were amazing. Thanks for playing the game. I want to take a moment and highlight some things from our student ministry. And you're thinking like, did I come to church today? Yes, you came to church. All right. And so I'm going to talk to you about a, a message called Committed. Somebody say Committed. And, uh, and then we want to highlight some things to you guys. We want to highlight some things from the student ministry here. And I also want to say thank you for being a church, as Gavin already said, that cares so deeply about kids in Crestview, from birth to, to 18, okay? We're ha we, have a we have around 180 kids every Sunday morning here in our kids' department, okay? From birth to eight, well, from three months. Don't bring your newborns yet, please, all right? But from, from three months... To, uh, to fifth grade, and then on Wednesday night, your teenagers and your kids come too. And there are kids' departments on Wednesday nights, just so you know, Royal Rangers and Impact Girls. Shout out to all those leaders. If you're one of those leaders, clap five times. Yep, there they are. They're here. All right, so shout out to all you guys. You're amazing. Um, I have the privilege of being able to coach other youth pastors and leaders from around the country, and I want you guys to know that what we have here at LifePoint, it's not normal, okay? It's not normal to have a church that cares so much about kids. And so from Kayla and I, we just want to say thank you to all of you. Um, the mission of LifePoint Youth is to create a place where people, I'm sorry, where students can belong before they believe and believe before they become everything that God has created them to be. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yeah. Yes, I would hope so. I would hope so because LifePoint Youth might be a small church where we teach things like community, we teach sanctification, worship, justification, but we are not our own separate church. And this is where so many youth ministries and honestly youth pastors get it wrong. They try to create their own little thing. We are a part of LifePoint Church, okay? We are LifePoint Youth. We are a part of LifePoint Church. We are the church. There's not kids ministry and youth ministry and adult ministry. We are the church. So can we just give it up for the church this morning? Come on. Uh, our average attendance on Wednesday nights in youth from January to July of this year was 74. We decided to take the first eight weeks of the school year, put an emphasis on creating a bring event for teenagers where everyone could bring one, right? So not the word everyone's, two words, right? Everyone 
bring one, all right? And so we challenge students to do that. Over the last eight weeks, we had 110 different students visit the youth ministry, yeah? Yeah? Of that 110 students, 55 students came back for a second time, and then actually studies show us if you come three times, then we got you, right? So I didn't give us some in first service, but we had 38 of the 55 come back a third time, and, uh, and then our average attendance actually went up from 74 per week to 118 per week. Yeah, yeah. So, which is uh, 58% growth since school started, okay? And I can really go into the numbers for you guys of like how many seniors graduated last year, how many students were gone during the summer, all these people come back. So thank you guys for, for trusting us. Thank you to Pastor Mike and Tammy for trusting Kayla and I and our wild ideas and then Gavin and the rest of our team that comes and they make these crazy things happen. And so I didn't want you guys to just hear from me though. I didn't wanna just brag on the youth ministry. I wanted you guys to hear some, from some teenagers about why they continue to come to Life Point. So I want you guys to check this out. I come to Life Point Youth to set an example for others and motivate others to strengthen their relationships with Jesus. After coming to Life Point Youth, Christ has showed me to forgive myself as He forgives me. I come to Life Point Youth because I can feel loved by Jesus and all the leaders. It is also a safe place that I can talk about my faith and learn how to grow closer with Jesus. One way that I've grown closer to Jesus is by learning that I'm God's masterpiece and that I can give all my anxieties and burdens to Him. I come to Life Point Youth because Life Point Youth is my family. Life Point Youth has has helped me grow my relationship with the Lord by showing me how good God is. One way Life Point Youth has helped me grow closer to the Lord is having a community that pushes me to Jesus. It encourages me to stay consistent in my Bible reading and grow into the godly woman I was created to be. One reason I come to Life Point Youth is because it's like a family to me and I can let my guard down and just love God and grow with others. I go to Life Point Youth because it's a great place to connect with people your age and grow closer to Jesus. One way Life Point Youth has helped me go closer to God is by always creating a safe and welcoming environment to worship Jesus however you want to. I come to Life Point Youth because it brings me happiness and I enjoy being a student leader and helping others with their walk with the Lord. After coming to Life Point Youth, it has shown me how to better myself and build relationships through Christ. The reason I come to Life Point Youth is because whenever I'm playing up on stage, I like seeing everybody just praising the Lord and having as much fun as I am up on stage. Since coming to Life Point Youth, I've grown with the Lord at youth camp, and just at youth camp, I've experienced the Lord in ways that I didn't even know were possible, and I'm really thankful for that. Come on, can we give it up for the teenagers today? I was Brody with the little youth camp plug this morning. Come on, youth camp. Hello, hello. In 2007, I know that was a long time ago for some of these teenagers. They make me feel very old. Uh, in 2007, I was asked for the first time to help lead a middle school ministry, and the name of that middle school ministry was H2O Junior High. It's also the password to all of my accounts, all right? So, and uh, I'm not giving you guys the rest. Kayla's like, what are you saying right now? All right, so... But that was the, that was the uh, youth mini- or the middle school ministry name, and some guy that you guys know asked me to help run that ministry, Pastor Mike, all right? And we actually came up with that name in a swimming pool, uh, like at midnight one night. We were swimming in a swimming pool. We we're like, what should we name this middle school ministry? And then he, he decided to change the youth group name to Liquid. He was like on a big water kick for some reason in 2007. I don't know. Water or youth ministry names were cool. That's because in like 2001, like youth ministry names like Flame. And burn, we're cool, all right? So we had to go, yeah, change it to water names. But in 2008, I was asked to come on staff. I came on staff as a staff assistant. I was Gavin. What Gavin is to us, I was Gavin to the staff at my previous church. And in 2023, I still love working with teenagers. They're crazy, they're wild, but they keep us young, they keep us fit, and, uh, and we love working with them. The big question that I always hear, though, is this. When are you going to become... A what? Anybody know how to finish that sentence? A real pastor. That's the question that I get asked. When are you going to become a real pastor? Well, I want to let you guys know today that uh, I am a real pastor, suckers. All right? So, all right? If people only knew, all right, here's why I continue to work with students all these, year la- all these years later. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just in my head thinking, is Pastor Mike going to get me at for service for calling everybody suckers? That's what's going through my head right now. So I'm going to hit some points today that are geared at, mostly at parents. You're going to hear them, but the truth is the bones of everything that I'm going to talk about 
apply to our daily walk with the Lord. So it doesn't matter if you have kids um, or your kids are older, they're out of your house. It doesn't matter if you're single or if you're married or you're a grandparent or you're a teenager. Everything I'm gonna talk about applies to the basic Christian life. If you're with me, say, I'm with you. I'm with you. And uh, in a recent study by Barna, one of the leading research companies on worldwide faith and culture, 65% of teenagers ages 13 to 22 identify as Christian. Barna then went on to define Christian teenagers into two different categories. The first one is committed Christians. Committed Christians self-identify as Christian and say they have made a personal commitment to follow Jesus Christ. And then the second was nominal Christians. Nominal Christians self-identify as Christian but have not made a personal commitment to follow Jesus Christ. So of that 65%, 32% identified as committed Christians, and the other 33% identified as nominal Christians. In other words, they're Christians by belief, not by action. Oh, that one landed for us this morning. I would challenge us today, are we Christians by belief and not by action? But for teenagers, this definition shows this, only one in three teenagers are considered committed Christians. Only one-third is nominally Christian, which means that they believe, but there's no action behind it. And then the other third, all others, they don't identify as Christian or they're unsure about who Jesus is. In other words, this part of the room believes, this part, this part of the room, sorry, this part of the room believes and lives it out. This part of the room believes, but there's no action. And then this part of the room, you guys don't know what you believe, right? Don't say amen to that, all right? So... <laughs> But that's what it would be. The study then goes on to show that by age 23, the percentage of committed Christians drops from 32% to only 17%, suggesting that one out of every five adults are committed Christians. One out of every five adults are committed Christians. Now, a lot can happen in that 18 to 23 range, right? Specifically university, college happens, okay, for a lot of people. But life happens for a lot of teenagers, and this is when they come to the fork in the road where they have to decide, am I gonna live this thing out or am I gonna do what I want? And the stats show us that most people go and do what they want. I want you to think back to when you were a kid, when you were a a beautiful young little child. Everybody remember that? Close your eyes and think about the little terror that you were, (laughs) right? You can open your eyes. I want you to think about what were some fundamental truths or fundamental actions that you have tried to instill into your kids or that your parents tried to instill in you as a kid? What were those things that your parents would say to you when you were little, right? No running in the house or uh, don't throw the ball or when you walk out of a room, make sure you, anybody knows? Turn off the light, right? Man, I would get whooped for leaving a light on, boy, I tell you what. Especially with FPL these days, I need to whoop my kids, man. No, I'm just, I'm just, no. But like, brush your teeth. Somebody said preach. Come on, somebody. Uh, Brush your teeth. That was one. Eat your vegetables, right? Uh, Be polite. Open the door for people. Be kind. One thing that we do in our house is I'm I'm Mr. Positive. I I like positivity all the time. So if I feel like we're being too negative in our house, we have I make somebody say three to five positive things about that negative thing. It drives me so crazy. Like they'll be like that stupid car up there. I tell you, I say you better tell me three things nice about that car. Positive right now. (laughs) It's a white car, it's got four tires, right? So that's what they started telling me. You see, your parents, or even you as parents, have tried or you're you're trying to instill good habits into your kids' lives or into your lives. And so things that make you a model citizen or a, a model kid or a model person, and that's amazing. But this is why I believe that we're seeing such a decline in committed Christians after high school and, and into adulthood. It's because we're not putting an emphasis on teaching Christian foundational things in our homes. We put too much pressure on the church to instill these fundamental Christian habits into our students' lives. And as adults, we don't take a lot of responsibility for it. And so I'm gonna give you guys a little illustration to to prove this this morning. I have a ping pong ball in my pocket here. Anybody, Anybody like ping pong balls, right? Anybody play ping pong? No, well that's terrible, all right? So, uh, anybody play pickleball? A couple of you guys, first service, the pickleball life group was like rocking it. 
Now the rest of you guys are like, I don't know why I'm here. All right, so it's good. I'm actually gonna make this ping pong ball disappear in my, I'm just kidding, I'm not, right? This ping pong ball represents one hour. We have one hour in the day, and now you're thinking like, why is this guy walking up on stage? This is Cam, thank you so much, Cam. He's walking up on stage because you know what? We all have how many hours in a day? Wait, come on, we know this. We all have how many hours in a day? 24. 24. So, so we're gonna have this represent one hour. We're gonna have this represent one day. And this one day of the week is gonna be Wednesday. All right, Wednesday, because that's whenever, uh, you know, I work on Wednesdays, Pastor Mike works on Sundays. That's about it, I guess. That's what people think. That was a joke. He laughed, nobody else did. All right, yeah, that was a joke. So this is gonna be Wednesday, all right? Now you have 24 hours in a day and your teenager comes to you, they come to you, so I get one of these hours and we're gonna trade it out with the white ball. And this white hour, the white ball is gonna represent Jesus, okay? So this is time with Jesus. Everybody got it? What's the white ball represent? Time with Jesus. So for one hour on one day a week, I get your students to come hang out and they get time with Jesus. But how many days are there in a week? Seven. Cam, would you help me out real quick? So seven times 24, anybody really quick? Wrong? <laughs> no, you were right. Seven times four is 28. I said it wrong. 24 times seven is 168. So I have 168 ping pong balls. Uh, that was so good. 28. All right. So I have 168 ping pong balls that represent one week. Somebody say one week. One week. One week. And so you know what? Your kid comes to youth. So we'll give them time with Jesus here. I'll take one hour out of there to replace it. We'll put it here. And now they have one hour in their week, but let's say they're super committed and they come for 90 minutes on Wednesday and they also come on Sundays, right? And so 90 plus 90 is what? Anybody know? 180, which would be three hours. So now we get them for three hours. They have time with Jesus here. I'll take these two hours away. And you guys didn't know y'all were coming to a math display today, but that's what it is. So... Here you go, this is in one week. One week you have all these hours and we get three hours if, if, if your kid comes to two services, Sunday and Wednesday, we get, two, we get three hours. Let's take the teenager out of it. Let's say that you come on Sunday and Wednesday. You get three hours, right, three hours out of the 168 are spent with Jesus so I think the question is, is how do we turn these orange balls, right, into more white balls, right? Cam, would you help me out really quick? Bring me the other balls, please, sir. Did you know that stats then go on to tell us that the average Christian only comes to church once every six weeks, once every six weeks? And so now we're gonna have not six weeks of ping pong balls because I didn't wanna spend that much money on ping pong balls like if you play ping pong, I'll give you these balls after, but evidently none of you guys do because none of you cheered when I asked, all right? Thank you, sir. Can y'all give it up for Cam? So the average church attender comes to church once every six weeks. If we, if we do the fractions on that, that would be one hour, right? One hour out of the two weeks would be time with Jesus. One hour. Let's shake it up. staying right on top, there you go. One hour out of two weeks on average is how much people, time people spend with Jesus. We've gotta change this, we've gotta get more white balls in here. Am I right? Yes. See, we put too much pressure on the church to instill Christian habits into teenagers, or even you as a young adult or an adult, and you're saying like, well, Pastor Mike doesn't tell, well, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike doesn't tell me a lot. My relationship with the Lord doesn't dictate on how much I see Pastor Mike, right? My relationship with the Lord is between me and him and what I do every single day. You know, of course students are looking for other ways to find information about their faith or to figure their faith out because this is only 2%. 2% of their time is spent with, with me or with Gavin or with a small group leader, 2%. Think about it like this. If you drop two pennies on the ground, would you stop to pick them up? You see, we focus on instilling fundamental habits like brushing our teeth, eating our vegetables, and being polite, but oftentimes never focus on instilling fundamental Christian habits into our kids' lives. And you're thinking, yes, I do. I force my kids to go to church. 
That would be my point exactly. Anything you force your kids to do, they most likely hate. So maybe you're thinking like, well, what, what would you suggest that I do? And I'm, I'm glad that you asked. The stats show us that roughly 83% of committed Christian adults make the decision as children and early youth. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. The stats show that roughly 83% of committed Christian adults make the decision as children and early youth to follow Christ, 13 and under. So going to church is important, right? Going to church is important, but you know what? It's not enough. It's, it's 2%. It's two pennies. It's, it's 2%. It's not enough. And so this could suggest that all youth ministries all over the world are failing or churches are failing, but I would disagree. In the same study that I quoted from Barner earlier, they then go on to show that roughly 77% of teenagers ages 13 to 22 in the United States are open to learning about who Jesus is. That's three out of every four teenagers are saying, you know what? Hey, I'm open to learn about who this Jesus is. I, you know what? I'm... I'm I'm, I'm down to hear somebody talk to me about who Jesus is. And then Barna goes on to say, the number one place they wanna hear about this from is their household. Their household. It's from you. It's from their parents, their grandparents. It's from their family unit. The second place, religious text. They go on to say that teens are more likely to report looking to these two sources other than Instead of social media, the internet, their friends, or influencers. And the church isn't even on the list. You see, when we look at the life of Jesus through the Gospels, we see a plethora of times when Jesus, the Son of God, retreats to pray. I want to show you some of these times this morning. We see it in Matthew 14, 23. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. We see it in Mark 1, in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Mark 6, 46, after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. <coughs> Excuse me. Luke 6, 12. It was at this time that he went off, off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And something that Luke then goes on to say, he says it at least two times, is that when Jesus prayed alone, the disciples were actually there with him. We see it in Luke 9, 18, and it happened that while he was there praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he questioned them, saying, who do people say that I am? And then we see it again in Luke 11, 1. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of the disciples, who evidently was with him, said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. So in essence, Jesus didn't look at the disciples and say, make sure that you brush your teeth or eat your vegetables or even that it's important to pray. Instead, Jesus said, hey, come with me. Watch me pray. Let's pray together. Come with me. Watch me pray. Come on, let's do this together. And so that leads me to believe that we can teach people what we know, but we really recreate who we are. I can give you all the information, but it's when you spend time with me that you start to respond like me. When your teenager starts acting up in your house, you start to look at, hey, who have you been hanging out with? Right? When your kid's wardrobe all of a sudden changes in your house, you start to look at them and go like, who you, who you been hanging out with? And what are your kids' responses? Well, well, they do this, and then what's your response? Well, I'm not their parent. Right? We, we, are, we are in this... My daughter's getting ready to be 13, so we're like in this living it right now. Praise God, pray with us. Yes, Lord, come on, somebody. <laughs> we teach what we know, but we recreate who we are. Your coworkers hear about your faith, but they never see you pray. Your friends see you post scripture about God, and then they see you post junk and crisp your word of mouth. And your students see you go to church on Sunday, but they don't see the church in you on Monday. You see, we teach what we know, but we recreate who we are. You can tell your kid to pray and to read and to worship all day long, but if they don't see you do it, they're not gonna do it. I believe that we continue to see people walk away from their faith because they never see us participate in our faith. Let me say it one more time for you. I believe we continue to see people walk away from their faith because they never see us participate in our own faith. And that's a tough pill to swallow, I get it. So the question is, is, how do we turn more of these balls from orange into white? Because going to church is good, 
but it's not good enough. When, Jesus, or when I see the 77% of teenagers are open to learning more about Jesus, and then I hear that only 17% of adults ages 23 and older are committed Christian, it gets me fired up. When I go from three out of four teenagers say they want to learn about Jesus, but one out of every five adults is a believer, we got, we got an issue. And the issue isn't the 44 minutes that I get on a Sunday morning, right? Or the, the sermon series that Pastor Mike preached. You know, one thing that's beautiful about this church that's so great is that people believe in Jesus here. (laughs) And you think like, what are you talking about? Like, well, I love my old church. I love a lot of people at that church. But the truth is I came from a church where a lot of people attended church, but they didn't act like the church. And so whenever I got to Life One, I learned a lot about, man, this this is what a healthy church can feel like. Now, I love my last church. I love my last leaders. They're great people. But it's the body that creates that healthy church. And so you guys are helping create a healthy church. That's why we continue to see so many adults, so many guests. Our our attendance has been close to 1,000 every Sunday. Close to 1,000 every Sunday between both services, yeah. And we go, we tell Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike doesn't like the the big numbers. He's not a big number fan. But if one, if if your family only comes to church one out every six weeks, think about how many people call Life Point their home. Right, because the truth is we had 133 in youth on Wednesday night, but 90 were missing. But I told you that the average is 118. Right, think about how many people call this church their home. You guys do a great job of participating in our faith, but we gotta do more. We gotta do more. So whether you're a parent of a student or, or in youth or you're not, maybe you're in the room and you're a single adult or you're married and you don't have any kids or your grandparents, if you're a person in this room I think that we can all agree that there's foundational Christian practices that we, need to impl- that we need to do in our life. And we must do it as often as possible to be what I would say an active follower of Jesus Christ, which the Bible would call a disciple. If you wanna be a disciple, you gotta do what Jesus did. If you wanna be a disciple, you gotta do what Jesus did. A couple of things that we see Jesus do. I'm gonna give you three things. If you wanna write them down, write them down, all right? The first one is we gotta pray. Somebody say pray. pray. We gotta pray. The second thing is we gotta worship. Somebody say worship. worship. And then the third thing is, is we gotta read scripture. We gotta read the Bible. Somebody say we gotta read. read. We gotta read. We gotta pray. We gotta worship. We gotta read. Now, if you get to hear me talk more than once every couple of weeks or whatever, I talk about these three things all the time, all the time. But whenever I see that stat drop after graduation, this makes me continue to talk about this all the time, right? Because I'm not like the youth pastor that's one or two years in. I'm, I'm starting my 16th year, okay? And I've continued to see teenagers that we've discipled over the years walk away. And it's because they never instilled th- these three spiritual habits in their life. Prayer, worship, reading the word. This is how I wrote it down. Prayer, somebody say pray. Families, pray together. Men, pray out loud in your homes. Kids, pray out loud in your homes. Ladies, pray out loud in your homes. People, we have got to make prayer a part of our daily lives. Pray out loud. Listen, if you're a teenager in the youth group and you end up in a prayer circle, they ain't looking at me because they get there. No, they know. I'm getting ready to say, Angel, would you pray? Right? I'm getting ready to say, Aiden, would you pray? I'm getting ready to call that teenager right there because these are the only prayer moments that some of these kids get. And they look at me like, oh my goodness, what am I getting ready to say? And it's because you know what they hear? They hear the, like the super spiritual prayers. If they only, if you only pray the way that you hear Pastor Mike and I pray or or Pastor Clarissa pray or Pastor Janelle pray or Pastor Tammy pray, that's our prayer language. You gotta have your prayer language, right? Let's, let's put it like this. Whenever Kayla and I started dating, I was like, yo, girl, what's up? All right? I, some of you guys are laughing. I, let me tell you, I'm gonna tell you a little trick that I did. She went to a different youth group, right? I dated the other youth group girls, okay? So I went to where they were. We had youth on Tuesday nights. I don't know why Pastor Mike picked Tuesday nights, but he did. We had youth on Tuesday nights. Kayla had youth on Wednesday night. So I would go to Wendy's when her youth group was there, and I would walk by her. I wouldn't say anything. I'd say hey to everybody else, and I'd walk by her, and I would just touch her back like this. And then I'd be like, see you guys, I'm leaving, right? 
Now, if I told you guys that's the best way to go pick up the girl that you want to marry one day, what would you say? Would you say yes or no? That's right, because that's my game. That's not your game, all right? So, so you got to get your prayer language, not our prayer language. You got to be praying a little more. Come on, somebody say pray. We got to pray. We got to fight to make prayer normal for ourselves. We got to fight to make prayer normal for our kids. We need to fight to make prayer normal in our marriages, right? When, when everything goes haywire, are you and your spouse praying together? That's important. That's important, right? Whenever your coworker comes to you and they're like, man, I'm limping. Why are you limping? I hurt my leg. Well, can I pray with you real quick? We've got to normalize prayer. Just like you open a soda when you get tired, that's normal, right? Just like you roll through Little Haven because you need to pick me up at two o'clock on Tuesday, that's normal, right? Prayer needs to become normal for you. Everything that you do revolves around prayer. Come on, we gotta start praying. I wrote it down like this. Fight to make prayer normal for your kids, your friends, and when things go crazy, they'll pray. Prayer will become a foundational belief for them and not just something that happens before a meal or happens at church or is said by someone with the title. You see, that's what messed up the early Christian church is that all these men with titles, they were just telling people what they wanted to be, what those men wanted. We see that in early Christian church. That's why there's so many people fought to get the Bible into your hands so that you could have a personal relationship. People died to get scripture into your house, just so that you know. Just so you know, people died, murdered, martyred at the stake so that you could have the word of God in your house. Right, and it's your personal relationship with him. Has anybody ever thought to yourself after you've said or done something, man, I sound like my parents. My dad, he has this hand thing that he does. Do you understand what I'm talking about, Clint? <laughs> yes, dad, I do, right? <laughs> and, so, and I worked for him for eight years and he fired me eight times, just so you guys know. That's the kind of relationship we had, yeah. You wait till you tell your mother you told me to shut up. I'm sorry, dad, you're fired, all right? And so. I worked at Applebee's, I called my mom, she'd be like, just go back to work tomorrow, honey, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll start holding my hand up, I'm like, man, I sound like, my, I sound like my dad. I sound like my parents, right? You guys know where I'm going with that? When your parents, or when your kids hear you pray, when prayer is something that's normal that happens into your house, it's something normal, something normal that's going on in your house, guess what? When your kids are adults, prayer will be something that's normal in their house. And if you start to think generational, right? If you have prayer in your house, that means your kids will have prayer in their house because they see you pray, they hear you pray, you pray together. And then they will pray with their kids and their kids will hear them pray, right? And then generational, your grandkids, the same thing. And then your great grandkids, the same thing. And that's how we see the church continue to go into the future, friends. We gotta pray, somebody say pray. pray. The second thing is, is worship. Somebody say worship. Usually when I talk about worship, I talk about all the other aspects of worshiping the Lord, like the, the way that you talk or the things that you give money to, or you know, just the way that you act. But today I'm straight up talking about music. Somebody say music, come on. Come on, somebody. If you guys don't know, I play the drums, and I'm, I'm the fourth drummer here. That's how terrible I am at the drums. I'm the fourth string drummer here. Like if everyone declines, they're like, hey Clint, could you possibly fill in? <laughs> sure, thanks for asking, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, I love music, and I, lo and I love worshiping through playing music. And I, I just, I wanna see other people worship the Lord the same way. And everyone's worship's gonna look different. But men, I have a challenge for you this morning. Man, worship the Lord. When you come into this church, this is such a cliche analogy that so many leaders use, but it's so true. Man, listen, worship the Lord that way you worship your team. Whether it's college football, I see a lot of crazy people at college football. You guys saw that orange flappy girl thing there in the worship? You guys thinking like, what is that girl doing in worship? Shrek showed up on stage for worship one day. I looked behind me, there was a Shrek behind me. I was like, what is going on right now? And I guess that Shrek loves Jesus. It was Jose, thank you, Jose, all right, so. But listen, whenever I see college football, football games and I see people painted in garnet and gold or blue and yellow or whatever your team is, I see all these things. Whenever I watch the Cowboys lose again tomorrow night, probably, you know, I'm gonna see people painted and doing all their stuff. And if these grown men can go wild for their team, then yeah. come on, can we go wild for the Lord, right? Yeah. And so I'm trying to teach you. Go ahead, you can clap for that. Praise God. <laughs> We're trying to teach your teenagers, your kids, that like, 
that this is a normal way of worship. Listen, David, David ripped his clothes off and started worshiping the Lord naked. His wife was looking at him like, what is that crazy man doing? Don't do that. You're going to go to jail, all right? <laughs> Don't do that. But man, I just want to see people worship in spirit and truth. The stats show us that if a man gives his heart to the Lord, surrenders his life to the Lord, over 90% of homes where the men is in the church will come to know Jesus. Yes. Right? And so, listen, you guys are thinking about what about my wife, right? Listen, women, they worship. It's just what they do. They start singing. You look at them, you're like, can you please sing a little quieter? Uh, like, you know what? Like, you're not Celine Dion. Calm down, all right? My heart will not go on. Come on. <laughs> my dad instilled character. You guys are thinking, like, that was so messed up. My wife was up here singing. I got to hear all. T- we sing together on Wednesday nights, and we will get in fights with each other. Like, you better stop singing like that, right? <laughs> It's not good. Anyways, come join the youth worship team. Hello. All right, so my dad instilled character traits in my life without ever talking to me about them. His life taught me a lot. Come on, think about that, dads. Think about that, men. Come on, mom, same thing with you. Think about that. You are instilling character traits into your life. What's great is my five-year-old now, he's starting to learn, but mom says that. But dad says that, right? We're learning really quick. Don't say that anymore, right? And so all the moms and dads were like, "Mm mm-hmm, come on, preach it, white boy, I heard you. I wrote it like this, if church is a chore for you, then church will be a chore for them. If you checked out during worship on Sunday, well, then you know how to finish that sentence. All right, church can't be a chore. Church has got to be a joy, man, a joy. Not to mention that, like, God is amazing, and then you have one of the best communicators as a lead pastor here. All right, so like church has got to be a joy. When you come to church, man, you come, have fun, meet some people, talk to some people, love on some people, and after you finish talking to them, walk away with that person feeling like, man, they were a breath of fresh air to me. They were a breath of fresh air. Be a breath of fresh air for somebody. Somebody have the fruit of the spirit in your life, a little bit of joy, right? Come on, somebody, a little bit of joy. Listen, I wrote it like this. You got a job? Anybody got a job? You work? Come on, you, you listen to music at work? Come on, turn some worship music on at work, yes. right? Have some people ask you, like, what, what are you listening to? Listen, I can, put, I can play you guys some Christian music in here, and you guys be like, is that even Christian music? Music has gone so far. I'm, I'm a little old school now. My favorite worship song is The Heart of Worship. If you play that song, I will hit the altar right now. Come on, so I'm coming back to, it's terrible. I'm just singing right now, okay? But, <laughs> but listen, turn some worship music on, and, and listen, worship, worship doesn't have to always be where the lights are off and the song is right. It can be right there after your boss walks away from their table when she's pulling her hair out of her head and you're going, dear Lord Jesus, I need you right now before I kill somebody. And, like, and then there, you start listening to that worship music. You get that all over your life. Listen, garbage in, garbage out. That's something Pastor Mike taught me growing up. Garbage in, garbage out. Ladies, I'm gonna say it like this. If you're listening to music where you're abused in music, then you're gonna probably walk, in around, walk around getting abused. Yeah. Guys, if you're listening to music, this one in the notes, but if you're listening to music where people are being abused all the time, then you're probably gonna ha- respond like an abuser. Yeah. Okay, yeah. gotta get worship in our life, all right? <laughs> and then the last one, is, or the first one was prayer. Somebody say pray. pray. Second one was worship. Somebody say worship. worship. And then the last one is reading scripture. Somebody say read. If you remember earlier, I talked about the two places that teenagers ages 13 to 22 are turning to learn about their faith. First one was their homes, and the second one was scripture. Fight to not only read the Bible in private in your home, because I know know a lot of you guys do this. Fight to not only read in private, but man, read in front of your kids. Let them see you read. I'm challenged in this. Something that happened last night at my house challenged me to the core when Kayla said, man, Faith, you're supposed to be reading Proverbs. Have you not been reading it? And, you know, Faith had her answer, and that challenged me to go, like, man, or why are we reading this together? Right, I mean, right there happened. Why aren't we reading this together? Or Because right, Kayla's like, hey, I'm reading every morning, but Faith doesn't see that. My kids don't see that, right? And so reading the, reading the Word has got to be something that you, do, that you do in private. You can have your time with God, but it's got to be something that you raise your house to do as well, yeah. right? And, and, you know, we, in stages of life, there's different stages of life. Like Pastor Janelle, she sent me a text earlier. Pastor Janelle, she's learning about that new mom stage of life. 
I'm sure her prayer time has turned a little different now that she has a beautiful little baby at home with her, right? And so I called her the other day because I actually asked her to come play the game with me if she was gonna be here. And I said, hey, I'm gonna play this game on Sunday. I think you'd be great because you're old. And uh, no. <laughs> And she's only a year older than me, right? So, but I said, I think you'd be great. And the baby starts crying. And I just kept talking right through the baby crying because we're just, we've had kids, right? And I was like, I'll let you go and, 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 and be with your baby. And so, but it's different stages of life. Figure out how you're gonna walk with the Lord in every stage of life. But bring your family along with you on that journey, okay? And so fight to not only read privately, but do it in a place where your kids see you. Pick scriptures and read them together. If you're thinking like, I don't know where to start, Pastor Mike put out a challenge two weeks ago when he said, hey, let's read the book of Proverbs one chapter every day for the whole month of October. And that happened to start on October 1st. So on the 1st, you would have read Proverbs 1. So today's the 15th. You would read what? Proverbs. And then tomorrow you would read Proverbs. And then Tuesday you would be, come on, praise God that you guys are with me this morning. All right. And so we want you guys to be in the word of God. Do it together as a family. Don't only read the word of God, but ask questions about the word of God. And your answer can't be this. This is a, this is a bad answer. I mean, there's no bad answers. There is. Okay? Because Pastor Mike said that it was that way. Because Clint said it was that way. You can't, ask the, you can't answer this question like that. You can't answer the question like, well, why do we believe that? Well, because Pastor Mike said to. Or Pastor Clint said to. Or, Pastor, or the church said to, Right? You gotta dig into scripture together. Hey, you know what, that's a great question. This is what we tell the youth leaders. It's okay to say, I don't know, youth leaders. Because you're gonna mess up some kid's faith when you give them some crazy answer. All right? And so you look at them and you say, hey, you know what, that's a great question, I don't know. Let's find that out together. Hey, that's a great question, I don't know. Let me call and see if I can ask one of the pastors this question. You know what I'm saying? Yes, you know what I'm saying. Listen, don't do this. Don't ask TikTok the answer. All right, TikTok is the number one uh, question website right now over Google, okay? And so on TikTok, I can ask this question. I can say, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And Jose's video is gonna pop up. Have you read your Bible today? If not, you know I got you, right? That's how Jose's on, on, on social media doing it like that. Other people's videos are gonna pop up. Let me tell you why the Bible's not true, right? Someone's gonna pop up like that. Let me tell you why Jesus had a girlfriend. Someone's gonna pop up like that, right? Let me tell you why we believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. You're gonna get all these things in 15 seconds that's gonna mess your faith up. And so many of those videos, respectfully, is some fool that thinks that they know that never studied, right? And they put it out there, and it shapes our foundational core beliefs. Okay, and it doesn't matter if you're, if you're 12, if you're 13, or if you're 50, or you're 60, or you're 70. This, the, the numbers show that people are going to social media to find their answers, okay? That's why we gotta be in the word of God. Somebody say read. read. Come on, somebody say read. read. Pastor Mike and I were talking about this. He made this. He said, you know what? What if we challenge people to start posting scriptures all over their house? Yeah. You know, we just, you know, he called it the sneak attack. He's like, what if we challenge a sneak attack, Right? And, you, and they, they go to get a Coke out of the fridge, right? And they pull out the Coke and there's a verse, right? Right there. You know what? They go and they get milk because they got to have that late, that late night cereal, right? And they get, that, they get that verse that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead, on, lead not on your own understanding. Come on, this is good dating advice too if you're single, just so you know. Because whenever guys or girls come to your house because they're dating with you, bad things can happen very quickly. It doesn't matter how old you are. But you start putting scriptures all up over your house, people know where you stand really quick. Yeah. Woo! That was a tough one. Pastor Mike literally just moved his foot. I'm like, a lot of people just <laughs> move their feet. That was a tough one. That's good dating advice. Come on, for teenagers, post teenagers. Bad things happen in your car when you're alone. Put some scriptures up in your vehicle. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Parents. Make your teenager hang out with two other people all the time. Okay? Listen, Pastor Mike and Tammy are a testimony to that. They have a, they have a, a great, they were teen parents. They have a great, great family, right? And praise God that their church cared about teenagers. I asked Pastor Clarissa for a picture of her when she was a teenager, and I ended up not using it. But praise God that you see it. I, I ended up not using it because I didn't go that route. But praise God. <laughs> I'm sorry, Pastor Clarissa. I'll put it up there. I'll put it on social media. Aaron, put Clarissa's picture on. <laughs> no. But here's the deal. Listen, I, you know what? How, how cool is it that Pastor Clarissa grew up a PK? We see a lot of PKs walk away from the Lord 
but she's up here leading worship with you guys every week because she was at a church that teenager, where teenagers were cared about. You never know what these teenagers in this room are gonna do, right? Are there any ninth graders in the room? Any ninth graders in the room? I know you're a ninth grader, right? I see you back here. I was talking to a friend who works at the school and she made this comment. The ninth graders will be the class that changes Crestview, right? And so, listen, we can all be a part of that. We can be a part of the 10th graders and the 11th graders and the 12th graders. You don't have a kid in high school, adopt a kid in this youth group, right? Just start loving on somebody. There's a man named Harold Weaver who told me how important I was all the time as a young adult. He spoke so much life into me because my parents, they all moved back to Texas, praise God, go Cowboys. But I stayed, I stayed, right? And Harold Weaver would come to me, he'd speak life over me. And he would tell me, he was way older than me. He's, he's probably got 30 years on me. And he would say, you know what, Clint, you're important. Hey, Clint, I believe in you. That's all that looks like. When you adopt a teenager, he knew my name and he told me I was valuable, right? We think about Jesus, right? He knows my name and he thinks that you're valuable. Come on, he modeled Jesus to me all the time. We gotta normalize walking with Jesus every day in our lives. Then we can trust that daily our kids will walk with Jesus. Come on, let me say it for you one more time as Angel comes. When we normalize walking with Jesus daily, then we can trust that daily our kids will walk with Jesus. Maybe you have kids today, maybe you don't, and you're thinking to yourself today, I don't have this kind of walk with the Lord. You can. You gotta pray. You gotta worship. You gotta read. These three things. These three things. I made a lot of references about the Cowboys, and I'll, I'll use the Miami Dolphins for this one, all right? And so let's just say that Pastor Mike is a huge Dolphins fan, and I told him, hey, listen, I know that, I know that the Dolphins come on. They're the noon game, so I need to hurry up, all right? But I got to go. I got to go today, okay, because I'm getting ready to suit up and play with the team. I got the jersey. I stole the helmet out of your office, all right? I'm going to put the pads. I bought some pads at Hibbit, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to play for the team. Right? Who's going to believe that I'm a part of the Dolphins? No. Nobody. Right? Pastor Mike's going to be like, give me my helmet back, and we may need to talk about your job next week. All right? <laughs> right? No one's going to believe. Right? That's because I don't, he doesn't see me at the field. He doesn't, I'm not at those practices. I'm not doing daily what those athletes are doing every single day. Well, friend, you can show up to church on Sunday, right? I can go to the stadium. We have youth leaders at the Colts game today. I know he's not playing for the Colts. He's just at the Colts game, right? There's like one guy who's like, yeah, Colts, right? But here's the deal. You can come to church on Sunday. You can do the stuff, right? But if you're not doing the daily things, come on, are you really walking this thing out? Are you really a disciple of Jesus? You gotta pray. You gotta pray. My, my youth pastor once told me this. When you pray, Talk to Jesus the same way that you talk to everybody else. Yeah. Hey, Lord, it's me again. Man, I, I really messed up. You know what? Hey, Lord, it's me again. Thank you so much for providing. Come on, like, hey, Lord, it's me again. I was just thinking about my daughter. I wanted to just let you know, what you think about her today? Like, and, and now I get to hear other teenagers, and a lot of those teenagers start the prayer with, hey, Lord, it's me. And that, that's because it's an example that I used. Come on, teach your kids how to have a prayer language. If this could be so weird in your house today, listen, go home and say this. We're gonna start doing this, guys. As a family, we're gonna start doing this, and it's gonna feel weird. That's how you start it. It's gonna feel weird, guys, that I'm gonna start praying. I want us to pray every morning before we all leave the house and go our separate ways. It's gonna feel weird. Just acknowledge the awkwardness that you haven't done it in the past, but say, moving forward, we're going to start doing this. And it's okay. That's how you get more orange balls become white balls, right? Acknowledge the awkwardness. Hey, this is what it is, guys. I recognize it. And now moving forward, we're gonna do this. We gotta pray, right? We gotta worship. I turn worship music on in your car. When I was a teenager, I took the antenna off my car so I could stop picking up radio stations because I was bad news. I was bad news. I was the guy that, that, you, didn't, that you did not want to talk to your daughter. I was bad news. And a lot of it was because of what I was feeding myself through music. A lot of hidden messages and music, friends, right? Take the spiritual antenna, like change the channel. Now they're on your windshield. If you rip your windshield off, we're gonna have a problem, right? So, but turn worship music on, go to YouTube. Hey, play worship, bless you. That's a youth leader, so I was used to that. No. Hey, when you go to Spotify, hey, worship. You don't, you don't even have to know the name of the band. 
right? You can send a message to the, the church Facebook page and say, hey, what was the songs that you guys played this morning? Go to, you know, just search worship music. So much worship music is gonna pop up. Worship's gotta become a part of your daily life, right? Let your kids see you do it. Let your spouse see you do it. Let your friends see you do it. Make it less awkward, okay? Don't be like David and dance in the street naked, right? Just be normal, okay? And start making worship a part of your every single day life. And the last thing you gotta do is read scripture. Read scripture. And we're all at different stages of life, so that's all gonna look different. It's not about the link that you read, okay? It's about time with Jesus. Now, is it important for me to do all three of these things? Yes, it's important. You know, I, you can say, well, Pastor Clint, am I gonna go to hell if I don't do these three things? I would say you're, you're not gonna go to hell, right? My marriage isn't gonna end because I don't, I don't tell Kayla I love her every day. But she might stop feeling like that after so many years if I don't start telling her. If you don't spend time with Jesus, right? I mean, he could say, depart from me for I never knew you. Come on, with every eye closed, every head bowed today. Maybe you're in the room today and you're thinking, I didn't know that there was a Jesus that cared about me this much. There is, there is. There's a God that loves you so much that he literally sent his son to this earth. His son lived a perfect sinless life for 33 years. And then he said yes to taking your place on a cross so that you could come to have a personal relationship with him. When he took your place on that cross, he was beaten and bruised, embarrassed and ashamed. But then three days later, he defeated death so that you could come to know the Lord, so that you could come to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship, that there wouldn't have to be any other middle person between you and your relationship with the God. Now, God loves you so much, and I don't know where you're at in your life, but he does. For some of you guys, maybe you're distant from the Lord because life's been a little rocky. Maybe it's been extremely difficult and you've been asking, hey God, where are you? I would say that this moment is for you. It's a story that we see that Jesus goes on to tell that, that the father never left the son, but the son left the father. But then daily the father would look out to see if the son was coming back. And Jesus goes on to tell us that the son came home and that the father celebrated, killed the fattened calf, got, the, got the, the ring for the family and celebrated the return of his son. And today I would say that the father's there, he's looking to see who's gonna come back to him. And so maybe you've never had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus or maybe you have and you've been distant and it's time to come home. With nobody looking around, if that's you and you're saying, hey, I wanna get right with Jesus today, would you just throw your hand up in the air? And the lights are really bright so it's hard for me to see. Can you just get my attention with nobody looking around? I see you too right here. Come on, I see you in the back, you two right there. I see your friend up there, so does Jesus, come on. I see you in the back right here. I see your friend back there, so does Jesus, amen. I see you, friend. Come on, anybody else this morning? I don't wanna miss anybody. I see you three up there, praise God, come on. Four, praise God, so does the Lord. I see you, friend. Come on, Jesus. Still with nobody looking around, there's a word in the Bible, it's called repent. And repentance means to turn your back on sin and to walk the other way. And so that's the decision that we make. We say, hey, I, God, I, I have sin in my life, but today I wanna surrender to you and choose to separate from that sin and walk away and now follow you. So just before I pray with you this morning, is there anybody else? You wanna separate from sin and choose to walk away. Well, come on, I'm gonna pray. And as I pray, would you just repeat after me? And let's do it together as a room so that no one feels ashamed or embarrassed. But let's pray like this. Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. Today, I surrender to you. I repent of my sins and choose to follow you. I recognize that it's not gonna be easy. I recognize my need for a savior. So will you encourage me? Will you equip me to continue to walk with you? Lord Jesus, the way I came in isn't the way that I'm leaving because I'm leaving with you. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, can we say amen this morning?